This is The Atomic Bombshell, The Minx Devlin Chronicles, a ten-part exploration of the astonishing life and tumultuous times of film noir goddess and 50s exploitation queen, Clara Minx Devlin. The woman who incinerates the screen with her evil desires. Trouble never came in a more seductive package. You know, it's funny. You're a tramp, a slaughter, a cheap, worthless strumpet, and yet I'm still madly in love with you. A Renoir portrait, as written by Balzac, but with the droll irony of Voltaire. She is, in my considered opinion, the most dangerous woman alive. Arlie Proctor here, along with Ms. Devlin's granddaughter, Hazel Matthews, and film scholar, Skylar DeWolf. In our last episode, Minx Devlin was cast adrift in an existential void, trying to survive a cascade of calamities. Loved by Fidel Castro, vilified by the Catholic Church, rescued by Ernest Hemingway, lost in Mexico for two years, and then kidnapped and returned to Howard Hughes, who demanded he marry her on his terms. She refused, and he left her alone with no car and no hope, stranded in the most desolate part of Nevada. That's where she is at the top of this episode. Abandoned and broke in real light Nevada, with no friends, no career, and no prospects. Right, but there's something different about Meeks, and if you read her journals, you can tell that she's worried, um, but not panicked, because she's doing what a hero does. She's coming to trust that she can shape her own destiny if she's brave and resourceful. Right, and you know, I, I said she was abandoned. That's, that's not quite true. Thanks to J. Edgar Hoover's obsession with her, Minx has two FBI agents right there in real light tracking her every move. So, what's going to happen next? Well, to misquote film director John L. Sullivan in Sullivan's Travels, if ever a plot needed a twist, this one does. And it gets one. When Minx comes downstairs after her debacle with Hughes, she sees a copy of the Elko, Nevada Daily Free Press with an article that sparks an idea. I have the article right here from her scrapbook. Okay. Headline, Shoestring Cinemogul Jailed in Man Act Rap. Dateline, Winnemucca, Nevada. Herbert W. Zussman, controversial producer of movies like Jailbait Baby and Lady Godiva's Bath, was arrested on five counts of violating the Man White Slave Traffic Act by transporting women across state lines for immoral purposes. He reportedly transported five women of dubious repute and uncertain moral character from California to Winnemucca, Nevada, to assist him in the making of a smut movie. The movie, tentatively titled Naked Holiday, They Wear the Wind, was being shot on location at the Garden of Eden nudist colony just north of the Winnemucca Indian Reservation in northern Nevada. Mr. Zussman denies all charges. He issued this statement. Rather than wallowing in the sordid, this movie celebrates wholesome, happy families reveling in the warmth of God's perfect sunshine without the fetters of clothing. Each of these five women came of her own free will and volition, and each is an experienced, dedicated nudist. Well, the five women are dancer performers at striptease clubs in the San Francisco area. They are Trudy Way Out West... Pepper Parker, the torrid tantalizer, Gilda Gaga Grable, the Golden Gate goddess, Blaze Babcock, the human heat wave, and last but not least, Bon Bon Laban, the ogolrific empress of Ooh La La. Listeners who have been with us for this whole adventure will recognize the name of Herbert W. Zussman. He discovered Minx, later rescued her from a possible prison sentence for a bogus pot bust by persuading the judge that he needed her to star in Thrill Queen, Minx Devlin's breakout hit feature film. His fascination with nudism climaxes later with his grand vision for the Naked World Vacation Resort. Right, so now Minx figures that maybe she can return the favor. She knows that the FBI agents are as eager to leave Realite as she is, so she talks them into driving her to Winnemucca for Zuzman's trial. There, she meets with Zuzman, and she shares her plan for getting him off, and this is from her journal. Herbie told the judge, back in 47, he needed me for Thrill Queen. 
Now I tell a different judge I need him for a very special project. At the trial, I sniffle into a hanky and become the guilt-ridden, contrite hussy. Yes, I was a communist. Yes, I made films that corrupted American youth. Yes, I was arrested for a narcotics possession. But now, Your Honor, I want to repent. Now I want to lead a good Christian life. I want to produce a film that will use the sordid example of my wanton past to shock young people into living a life of rectitude. That's why Mr. Zussman must be found innocent, because he alone has the expertise to produce and direct a film that will redeem American youth. We will reveal what every young American must know about the menace of renegade sexuality. The case was weak anyway, and the jury tumbles for this hogwash, hook, line, and sinker. Herbie is freed on the condition that we hold a screening of this film for the judge in six months. I'm back in business. What the business is, I'm not quite sure. And I'm partnered with a man who is as crooked as a pretzel and as slippery as an eel dipped in lard. Skyler, please tell our listeners about this film. Uh, I, w- I will try. It is a 14-minute, no-budget, high school mental hygiene epic called, get ready for it, Claptrap. Minx is an alluring, seductive strumpet who gives the male lead, J.D., syphilis. And then he passes it along to Prudence, the demure, naive young girl who foolishly goes all the way with him. Well, then she ponders self-murder, but she finally finds redemption at the end when she enters the sacred heart of the Blessed Virgin Catholic Convent. I'm betting that Claptrap is the most seen Minx Devlin film in her entire filmography. Zuzman formed a sham company called Play Safe Pictures, and he sold it to every school district in America. Some version of this two-day wonder unspooled in an American classroom every day for the next 20-plus years. So, what happens next? Here's Minx from her journals. After we wrap, Herb invites me to dinner at Winnemucca's finest eatery, Spud and Elma's Squat and Gobble Barbecue Pit. Even before he sits down, he tells me that he's a genius, and I'm going to fall in love with him. I scoff as he unfurls a movie poster. And then I gasp and dissolve into a fit of giggles. It's about as subtle as an air raid siren. Skylar, don't you you have this poster, right? Yes, Hazel has it. Uh, so there's Minx in a black leather jacket, steering a hot rod with one hand and holding a machine gun in the other to hold off the cops. Oh, and there's a wigged out female rock and roll combo in the rumble seat. The copy reads, Minx Devlin, America's baddest bad girl, ignites the screen in hot rod girl gang. Crime crazy chicks out for hot rod kicks. Loving, lying, living to a frenzied rock and roll beat. Nothing can tame them. Scandal can't shame them. Oh, wow. So, so, so what did Minx think of this? She writes, I'm delighted and dumbfounded. Herb says, how'd you like to be a star again? Bigger than ever. Is this guy crazy? I say, Herb, what about the blacklist? I'm poison. Nobody will show my films. He gave me that I've got a secret smile of his and says, yeah, well, yours truly has been having a righteous chin wag with the schmoes who run drive-ins. They could give a shit about the blacklist, and they're sick to death of that boring, overpriced crap the studios shut down their throats. I started throwing titles at them, uh, teenage thrill-kill stuff, you know, like Bride of the Astro Beast and uh, Beatnik Dope Racket, and every one of them lit up like a Times Square marquee. So now I'm starting to get excited. And you mentioned my name? Herb says, yeah, Guy says, Herb, you could put Eva freaking Braun in these pictures as long as they got rock and roll, a hot rod race, and plenty of sexy babes and tight sweaters. You see, it's a whole new racket. Herb doesn't want me for one movie. He wants me to make 18 movies, nine double bills, and make them all at once. Do I want to be a part of this? Hell yes, I do. So once again, Herbert W. Zuzman again subverts the motion picture industry by marketing just the right product in just the right way at just the right time. What Zuzman understood was that older Americans had stopped going to the movies every week and a new generation of moviegoers, and I'm talking about teenage baby boomers, were dying to get out of the house so they could drink beer, smoke cigarettes, and to quote Meatloaf, find paradise by a dashboard light. And so, Z.I.P., Zussman International Pictures was born. 
Well, Zussman's idea was to produce teen exploitation pictures so quickly and so cheaply that he could sell drive-in theaters a double bill at a flat rate that was about half what the major studios charged for a single picture. Mr. Zussman, in virtual partnership with Minx Devlin, produced 18 movies in 18 months, which is an insane amount of film production, but it produced nine legendary double bills. I believe Ms. Devlin described this process in her journal. It's not like making 18 separate pictures. It's like making one gigantic, crazy, no budget, hallucinatory monster epic. The whole rampage is a kind of wild fun blur, throwing on some threadbare costume, getting dialogue hand scrawled on the back of the dirty envelope five minutes before the cameras roll, doing my own makeup, cobbling together balsa wood sets, moving props. I even sling hash for two of the shoots. Sometimes we make three films at once. I change out of my girl gang leather jacket and chinos and into my evil goddess robes and then into a lab coat and horned rimmed glasses to become a nuclear physicist all in the same day. In some crazy funhouse way, this is the essence of show business. Playing, laughing, making believe. I even become slightly fond of the ardent Mr. Zuzman. He's the one giving me a chance, or should I say 18 chances, to break the blacklist and do what I love. Oh, he screams, throws tantrums, and uses a bull whip to make things go faster. But if he gets too tough with me, I tell him to use a blasting cap as a tongue depressor. He laughs, and we move on. 18 pictures. Man, that's quite a bit of material here. Oof, you said it. Well, here is a quick mashup of some of the titles and some of the taglines. Here they come. You've never seen anything like... The She-Devils of Yucca Flats. Nuclear hell vixens on a rampage of lust. It's shocking. It's sordid. It's beatnik dope racket. Today's young rebels, the drifters, the hipsters, the hot sisters, who get crazy in a winked out world of their own. It's here, the big one you've been waiting for. Mink Stevlin is the amazing colossal stripper. An alluring colossus of female flesh, titanic torso, colossal cupcakes, giant desires, bubbling in a Vesuvius of revenge. Wow. Now, this being the 1950s, uh, there must have been a colossal, hideous mutant bug movie. From hell it came, Teen Rantula. An unstoppable, cold-blooded, mega-mutant arachnid stalks hot-blooded hepcats in a riot rampage of teen terror. Okay, so the striking thing about these pictures is how perfectly they captured the anxieties of everyday Americans. I mean, everything that happened in the 1960s, we're talking kids rebelling and running wild, rampant drug abuse, rock and roll moving to the center of the culture, it's all right there in these films, only no one noticed because only kids saw them. Herb Zussman opens the first double bill, Study Hall Rock and Hot Rod Girl Gang, featuring blacklisted actress Minx Devlin, on 1,371 drive-in screens. Wow. And this is an important day. Zussman defies the American Legion, tells the Red Channel's crowd to go to hell, and the result? No protests. No picket lines. Nothing but teenagers lined up for miles to give him their money. Kirk Douglas often gets the credit for breaking the blacklist by hiring Hollywood 10 screenwriter Dalton Trumbo for Spartacus. Well, that happens two years after this. Douglas and Trumbo walk through a door that Minx Devlin has opened for them. Here's Minx from her journal. We wrap the last of these 18 masterworks in late June of 1958. For the next three and a half months, Herbie and I tour the sticks, putting 18,000 miles on his new turquoise and coral Edsel Ranger convertible, living in an Airstream trailer, appearing at drive-ins, ballyhooing the movies. We end up in Las Vegas on October 29, 1958, my 30th birthday. This one 24-hour period will turn out to be a fully realized microdrama of my entire hallucinatory life with Herbie. A decade that begins with an exhilarating, drunken, debauched calamity and ends the same way. We began this morning, as always, with a stout pitcher of Bloody Marys. 
now we're cruising the interstate, embroiled in a colossal fracas about my contract, which is, in fact, a handshake. He loudly claims that he owns me in perpetuity since he gave me a new career. He says, without me, you'd be in the gutter. I point out that slavery was outlawed by the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, and I'm just about to grab his fat neck and throttle him when he pulls over and screams at me, so you want to get married or what? And I'm so shocked to hear the words, um, sure, comes out of my mouth. What am I thinking? I'm not, of course. So why do I say yes? Some weird combination of alcoholic exhilaration, gratitude, and lack of any better offers. Gratitude. Zuzman brought me to Hollywood and made me a star, and then bailed me out not once, but twice. First the pot bust, and now the blacklist. I start to cry, for happiness, certainly. He knows me and wants me. Fear? Absolutely. I'm scared to death because I know his history with women. Rage? Probably. I'm angry with myself for letting him ambush me. Oh, all that booze. All day long doesn't improve my judgment. On to the infamous wedding night. Herb and Minks have their first fight ten minutes after they get hitched. She wants to spend the wedding night at the dunes. He insists they spend it in their non-air-conditioned Airstream trailer. And by the way, it's 110 degrees outside. Minx wins and they check in to the dunes. We interrupt this podcast to clear up a misconception. This podcast is not the work of an eccentric group of whimsical billionaires. It is, in fact, produced by salt-of-the-earth, just plain folks like you. That's why we're asking that if you like the podcast, and if you've got a kind heart and generous nature, please head over to richlyspun.com and send us whatever monetary donation you think best. We promise to spend it on making more podcasts like this one. And now, back to this one. Thanks. The marriage in a nutshell. While I sleep off my cut-rate champagne hangover, he drops two grand playing craps. Oh, and did I mention he takes the two grand from my suitcase while I'm asleep? Some French filmmakers made the definitive documentary on the life and work of Herbert Zussman in 1974. These next uh, clips are from that documentary with commentary from Minx Devlin's journals. So it's our wedding night. We head over to the Casbah Lounge to see... Louis Prima and Keeley Smith. I order martinis and lay a 50 on Sam Butera to tell Louis to tell the world we're hitched. Turns out Sinatra is there, heckling the band. He jumps up on stage, and then Louis drags Minx up there, and they sing, Hey Boy, Hey Girl, and then the song is you. That's what he sang to her on her 21st birthday. I don't like the way this is going. They go bastards trying to get fresh. Herb is pifflicated. He thinks Sinatra is flirting with me, so he rumbles on stage and throws a wild haymaker at him. Sinatra decks him with one punch. Herbie staggers off, and that's the last I see of him for about three and a half hours. I finally cab it back to our room at the dunes, sick with fear that he's either killed somebody or been murdered by one of Frank's bodyguards. Then I get a phone call from the house detective at the dunes. He's got Herbie hiding out in the manager's office. Why? Because there's a mobster, Nicky D'Annunzio. He's what's known in the underworld as a button man. Look, I went back to the dunes to apologize to Minx, but she wasn't there yet. So I knew that the ex-wife number four, Sybil Crunkleton, only now she's calling herself Nymphomaniac, was in one of those nudie reviews called Holiday for G-Strings. So I go backstage to say hello, and she starts crying her eyes out about her boyfriend is beating the shit out of her. So naturally, I put my arms around her, and that's when Nikki walks in. And there's a scuffle, and yeah, a gunshot. Well, anyway. It's 4 a.m., and I'm out of my mind with fear. That's when the security guy from the dunes tells me what happened. Herbie has hit the trifecta. He abandons me on our wedding night. He gets caught canoodling with his ex-wife, and he gets targeted by an underworld torpedo who would happily kill his own grandmother for a Zippo lighter. I guess the only good news 
is that I'm now sober enough to put this marriage out of its misery. Well, as a Minx Devlin scholar, I have come to know quite a bit about the career of Herbert Zussman. And I have to say that considering this dire circumstance, he makes what I consider a genius move to save his marriage. Daylight is breaking across the Nevada-California border as Herb pilots the Edsel convertible with Minx in the passenger seat. She won't even talk to him. She won't even look at him. How is he going to recover? Here's Minx in her journal. He says, Men are stupid. We were put on earth to be dumb. It's our gift to the world. And I can't help myself. I actually smile. And then he says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take one million smackers of my own loot, and I'm going to put them in your hands, and you and I are going to produce a Technicolor major mega first-run science fiction adventure movie starring you, produced by you and me together, and directed by me. And the whole premise of this movie is that men are stupid. How can you hate somebody's guts and adore them at the same time? Herb Zuzman may be a degenerate, unreliable scumbag, but he is also the most entertaining person I have ever met. So when I stop giggling, I say, sure, why the hell not? And so begins the tortured saga of They Came in Outer Space. Skyler, this is one of your favorite Mink Stevlin films. Oh, you bet. They Came in Outer Space is one of a peculiar subgenre of male self-abasement epics lensed in the 1950s. And I'm talking about movies like Zsa Zsa Gabor's Queen of Outer Space, Sonny Tuff's Victor Jory, Marie Windsor, 3D Wonderwork, Cat Women of the Moon. Wow, that is a great 3D movie, by the way. The premise of these films is that masculine lust will destroy even the tiniest scintilla of human reason, leading otherwise brainy hunks to their doom. Each movie posits a race of luscious, man-hungry female aliens desperate to reproduce. They lure men to their planet under the shoddiest of pretenses, and then they enslave them. And somehow these lunkheads always stumble home, and even then they manage to miss the point of their misadventure. But Zuzman understood the real point of these misbegotten epics. I could give a shit about the plot. What I wanted was minx and some other busty babes in skin-tight metallic jumpsuits gun-wielding beefcake, cat fights, rocket ships, and enough hot-blooded sex action to get six million teenage boys to plunk their magic twangers. For once in his life, Herb Zuzman is true to his word. He makes, and I star in, a decently produced, mainstream, technicolor movie with passable special effects. The subject of this movie is indeed that men are lunkheads, and, her being Herb, Whatever goodwill he builds up with me is now immediately blown to smithereens. The picture opens, and it's a huge hit. Herb tells me he's going to sell his house and buy a new one, so there's no point in us moving in together. Why don't I just stay at a hotel until the new house is ready? So I'm lounging poolside at the Hollywood Roosevelt when I pick up a copy of Daily Variety and see this headline. Passion Pit Pick Pasha dumps Devlin for Teen Temptress preps program of pricey picks. Wow. Well, the Teen Temptress was Beverly Love, and she was just 17, if you know what I mean. Had just played Luna in They Came in Outer Space, and Mr. Zuzman had signed her to play Lady Macbeth in Switchblade Psycho, a rock and roll version of Shakespeare's play that co starred Fabian. Remember Fabian? In the article, he describes Ms. Love as a, quote, charismatic tigress who will ignite the screen in a role crafted to reveal the many facets of her burgeoning talent, end quote. Maybe it's the brazen rub-my-nose-in-it-who-cares way he does it. Maybe it's the fact that half of the money he's about to lob into the bonfire of this bimbet's non-career is mine, under California community property. Or maybe it's a decade of being browbeaten, mishandled, and mugged by hubristic males especially ones who insist they love me. Whatever it is, something snaps. I check out of the hotel, and I'm ready to have it out with him. As I drive over there, I pull on a bottle of peach brandy to fortify myself. I figure Herbie has forgotten I have keys to his front door. I tiptoe in, and immediately hear the familiar eek, eek, eek of bed springs. I can feel the throb of blood in my throat. My heart is hammering inside my chest as I move to the bedroom. I don't want to kill him, just scare him to death. 
I remember the Colt Anaconda hand cannon he keeps in the nightstand next to his bed. Eek, eek, eek. The rhythm of the bed springs quickens from Adante to Allegro. I have to move fast, now. I hurl myself into that room and look at the bed. There's a writhing body buried beneath the serpentine limbs of enthusiastic twin blondes in black garter belts. I stride over to the nightstand, yank it open, and grab the huge chrome revolver. Turns out I've timed it perfectly, because Herbie grunts out an uncharacteristically subdued orgasm just as I slip my finger on the trigger. I hear a whispered, oh, shit, and the blondes scream, unfurl themselves, and scramble out of the line of fire. My trigger finger is quivering. I tip the gun up slightly and take a bead on the Betty Page bondage photos over his bed. The kick flattens me. To break my fall, I let go of the piece, and it tumbles across the floor, barrel smoking. The twins are screeching, clutching their clothes, and scrambling for the corner of the room. But curiously, the man in the bed doesn't join them. In fact, he just sits up and stares at me. He's weirdly calm as if we've just met at a cocktail party and he's trying to place my face. I drag my sleeve across my eyes and stare again. Now it's my turn to say, oh shit. It's not Herbie. It takes me a couple of seconds to lock in on the face. This this guy is, what, is a movie star? Is that Peter Lawford? No, 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 wait. It's not a movie star. Where have I seen him? He's a dead ringer for that handsome young senator from Massachusetts, you know, John Kennedy. (gasps) What the hell? Now several calamities pile into each other like trucks in a foggy interstate. First, two crew cuts in baggy suits hurl themselves into the room, guns drawn. FBI, of course. And then we're assaulted by the ear-splitting thunder of shattering glass. One of the full-length sliding doors leading to the pool blows out into a million shards and strobes of blinding light assault us, punctuated with the occasional aha and got you. A gray-haired hunchback with a huge speed graphic camera stalks the guy in the bed. The flash bulbs sizzle, then explode on the floor. JFK yells, son of a bitch. And then, stark naked, he tackles the shutter bug. They both die for the gun on the floor. And now my ever-loving hubby shows up, martini glass in hand. He fills the doorway, draped in his signature terry cloth bathroom with a gigantic HZ stitched in gold, and he says, what the hell is this? Another gunshot dynamites the air around us, ricochets off the steel safe concealed behind the Betty Page pictures, and hits Herbie in the crotch. He collapses like a demolitioned housing project and shrieks like a harpooned hippo. I gasp and then try to scream, but there's nothing, just empty air. What has happened? All eyes focus on the smoking gun in the hand of Senator Kennedy. For a single, endless moment, everyone looks at each other. Then Kennedy sweeps his knuckles across Hunchback's face, knocking him out. I'm catatonic. Everyone else darts about with harried robotic efficiency. The senator snatches up the camera, opens the back, ruins the film, and then smashes it on the floor. And one of the FBI agents phones for an ambulance. The other grabs the gun and hustles Kennedy out of the room. My eyes begin to pinwheel, and I'm twisting in a slow motion plunge into a welcoming, warm pool of blackness. This pool gathers me in its arms and hugs me like a second skin. I surrender. Here's the first headline from a scrapbook. Police seek thrill queen in shooting of wayward hubby. Mink Stevlin, sultry screen siren once banished from films because of her ties to the American Communist Party, is being sought by police in the shooting of her husband, controversial film mogul Herbert W. Zuzman. Police inspector Barney Kruger told reporters, quote, We've got the victim and the motive. I'm confident we'll find the weapon. It appears we've got the goods to put Miss Devlin in the big house till doomsday. And just for fun, here is the cover of Hush Hush magazine that week. Ah, now, now catch this. This, uh, this. They don't write headlines like this anymore. Gat-wielding goddess ventilates love pirate papa in drunken Screenland gun shocker. Eat lead louse, screams soused slattern. So Minx is the sole focus of these stories. I mean, where's Kennedy? Where's the FBI? Who's the guy with the speed graphic camera? What we know from her journal is that John F. Kennedy is using Herb Zussman's hideaway as a love nest as he crisscrosses the country to raise money for his presidential campaign. The photographer is Dr. Rufus Gilpatrick, 
an obsessed member of the John Birch Society, an anti-Catholic zealot who is convinced that, if elected, Jack Kennedy is going to turn America over to the pontiff and relocate the capital to Vatican City. The FBI has been shadowing Gilpatrick at the behest of JFK's father, Joe Kennedy. Minx wakes up and looking into the eyes of John F. Kennedy. They're on Frank Sinatra's airplane. JFK wants to make a deal, keep his name out of the case, and he'll get her cleared of the attempted murder charge. Here's a snippet from the journal. He leans down and whispers, It's all fixed up. Trust me, okay? Almost by reflex, I squeeze his hand and my eyes say yes. He squeezes my hand and answer, You and I are going to make history, Clara. How right he is. The plane lands in San Francisco, dropping off JFK and his team. Then it turns around and lands back in Los Angeles. Minx is met by Kennedy lawyer H. Riley Dunkirk, the family fixer. The LAPD books Minx for attempted murder. She spends a night in jail. Dunkirk pays a bondsman half a million dollars to bail her out. And what follows is the infamous Atomic Nympho trial. The district attorney is a chap named Lou Price, who sees putting Minx Devlin in the gas chamber as his ticket to the governor's mansion. In his opening statement, Price calls Minx, quote, a tipsy, trigger-fingered tart, enraged by jealousy, rendered senseless by drink, and consumed with the thought of giving her husband lead poisoning. In order to convict Minx, the DA convinces Gilpatrick to leave Kennedy and the FBI out of it. Gilpatrick takes the stand and fingers Minx as the one who pulled the trigger. It looks like Minx is going to be convicted until... And this is the headline from the Los Angeles Times. Devlin court stunner. Smoking gun points at key witness. DA screams foul as defense discovers lost murder weapon. Somehow, the weapon shows up in the evidence room of the LAPD. And it's got Gilpatrick's prints on it not Minx Devlin's, and not JFK's. Turns out, JFK kept his promise. His man Dunkirk got J. Edgar Hoover to fix up the evidence as a favor for his old pal Joe Kennedy. And so Hoover would have something on JFK if Jack ever became president. This is how the big boys play. When I walk out of that courtroom, Dunkirk puts me in a taxi cab. He says Mr. Kennedy wishes to express his gratitude. The cab drives me to an auto showroom at 9th and Figueroa. The salesman says, Ah, Miss Devlin, I have the honor of presenting you with your new automobile. Step over here, won't you? Suddenly, I'm looking at my new flamingo pink 1959 Cadillac Biarritz convertible with a full leather interior and cherry moon glow red. Not quite as big as an aircraft carrier and no heavier than an M4 Sherman tank. It has the look, heft, and bearing of a luxury ocean liner with the style of a Flash Gordon space cruiser. I weep with joy. This look-at-me beauty is mine. Mr. Kennedy has truly expressed his gratitude. And what I can't get over is that this is the very car, the, the one that Minx is driving when she meets her grisly end on a long highway in the Nevada desert just ten years later. Hi, this is Arlie Proctor. You've been listening to episode six of our podcast, You know, I've covered many stories in my journalism career, but none has surprised me, engaged me, and touched me as deeply as the saga of Minx Devlin. Her courage in the face of impossible situations, her humanity when forced to make impossible choices, she'd become kind of a hero to me. I felt as if I'd gotten to know her, as if she were a friend. I had the final three podcast programs all ready to go when I was blindsided by the most shocking revelation of all. Hello. Hello. Is this R. Lee Proctor of the Minx Devlin Chronicles? That's right. Well, I'm happy to speak with you, Mr. Proctor. You're not doing that bad a job. You got it mostly right. I'm impressed. I'm sorry. Who is this? I'm Clara Devlin. 
Give me that again. <laughs> I'm Clara Devlin, Minx Devlin. You're, you're alive? I think so, last time I checked. But, well, there was the accident in the desert back in 1969. Well, I'll explain all that if you want to get together. I, I happen to be here in Las Vegas. I'm 90 years old, though. I'd advise you to hurry. The Atomic Bombshell, The Minx Devlin Chronicles, is produced in Hollywood, California by Tales Richly Spun. This episode is directed, produced, and edited by Matthew Solari. Written by Arlie Proctor, co-producer Kevin Whitaker, artwork by Rowan Proctor. Special thanks to Caitlin Mulder and Stephen Smith, Nancy Linehan Charles, Tony Russomano, and Michael Rothar. Please visit richlyspun.com slash atomic bombshell to find books and movies that take you deeper into the misunderstood decade of the 1950s, featuring nuclear paranoia, giant irradiated bug movies, and rock and roll rebels looking for a cause. And now, finally it can be told. Yes, now you can own The Atomic Bombshell, The Astonishing Life and Tumultuous Times of Clara Minx Devlin, a memoir as told to Hazel Matthews, This is the book that Hazel and Minx put together over the year it took to produce this podcast. Next episode, Minx Devlin, the atomic bombshell herself, joins us for episode number seven, Jailbait Baby. (laughs) 